Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have on with us Karen Schles-Presley. Karen, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jeff. It is so glad we are doing this. Likewise, I'm very excited about your new book, Escaping Scientology, An Insider's True Story, My Journey with the Cult of Celebrity, Spirituality, Greed, and Power, again by Karen Schles-Presley. Karen, you were commanding officer of the Celebrity Center. Yes, that was uh, sometime between 1987 to the end of 1989. You were married to Peter Schles. We had a 20-year marriage. We were married for almost eight years before we actually got into Scientology. Peter's famous in the music world. On the Wings of Love, he, he did the music for Jeffrey Osborne. He did. He actually composed the music, and then, uh, but he specifically composed the music for Jeffrey Osborne. He studied Jeffrey's vocals to make sure that that music would go from capture the best in the highs and lows of his voice. And he pitched the music to Jeffrey. Jeffrey wrote three different sets of lyrics, and together the three of us chose the lyrics on the wings of love for that song. So, I mean, for sure that was Peter's, you know most successful song. Uh, he won the um, BMI Most Played Song of the Year Award in 1983, and uh, the song was performed at the Grammys, so it was definitely the peak of our career. Can you tell us briefly how you get into Scientology and then how you get into the C organization? It's a very unique story. I don't know of too many other people who have had a successful career in the entertainment business and then joined the Sea Org at Celebrity Center, and then went up to the International Management Base to work in David Miscavige's Inner Sanctum. I don't know, I don't know of any other artists who have actually made that transition. And I really believe it happened because when Peter and I first came to the Celebrity Center, we were absolutely smitten with the... Um, inclusive environment of Celebrity Center that just elevates the artist. Um, you know, from pretty much day one, you're treated like a, a special breed of individual. Uh, it, you're almost on an intravenous drip of uh, support and love bombing and like being fed, you know, you're, you know, artists are the most important um, people on planet Earth because the uh, people who have an aesthetic mind, Hubbard says, uh, can elevate the tone of a culture. And so you're, you're, you're groomed to believe that you're so significant and that you can be a world changer just by being who you are as an artist that, you know, why wouldn't, why wouldn't an artist want to be at Celebrity Center when you're treated like that? I mean, after all, you know, Hollywood is an extremely competitive environment and oftentimes feeling very intimidating and even dangerous. Um, and so Celebrity Center was like a fortress for us. And you're pretty much revered just for even showing up. So the point of saying all that is, you know, all that adds up to what I what I call in my book celebrity spirituality and it becomes almost an addiction almost a codependent relationship where the artist we needed celebrity center to support us with Scientology and of course Scientology needs celebrities because celebrities become the walking mouthpieces for Scientology so we needed each other but that became a very codependent relationship which you know, when you think of codependent relationship, that's a dysfunctional relationship where you are enabling each other. So you become very addicted to the, to the environment. And because of that, you know, we went from being totally focused on our career to being totally focused on keeping Scientology working. And, you know, if you're a dedicated Scientologist and you're committed to the purpose of clearing the planet, uh, all you start to care about is keeping Scientology working. And so I'll never forget, I think the defining moment for us was uh, Peter and I uh, were asked by 
this was before we joined the Sea Org, of course, we were asked by the president of CC to um, take responsibility for bringing celebrities to Portland for the Religious Freedom Crusade. So we called up, you know, some of the biggest people we knew, and within 24 hours, we assembled a band of, like, the percussionist from Santana and keyboard player from Stevie Wonder, and uh, we recruited Frank Stallone to stand for religious freedom, and long story short, we got all these celebrities arrived to Portland. And while we were there, <clears throat> all we focused on was defending Scientology, and we, we started to believe that Standing for quote unquote religious freedom, which is what the Portland Religious Freedom Crusade was all about. It was like religious freedom in general. It wasn't just, you know, protecting Scientology against this one legal case. So we got totally swept up in the purpose of that, and it felt like we had discovered a game that was bigger than us. It was a bigger than life game, and we had plugged into it, and we had found a place in it. So all of that being said, and then you know, Scientology won the court case, and we took that as, wow, you know, we were able to rally celebrities, we were able to win a court case, and we worked side by side with Sea Org members during the whole Portland Crusade, so we got a taste of what it was like to live a totally uh, dedicated life to this purpose. And when we got back home after the Portland Crusade, we walked into our house, we hadn't lived there in a month. We had a stack of bills um, that took about $10,000 to pay off. And we looked at each other, and all of a sudden, our incredible careers just um, were absolutely diminished compared to what we had gotten ourselves into in terms of, you know, defending, quote-unquote, religious freedom. So, literally, we lost ourselves to Scientology at that point. And it was not long after that, then L. Ron Hubbard died, and I had signed my Sea Org contract, and I routed into the Sea Org at that time. Literally walked out of my career, and then Peter followed me shortly thereafter. Karen, you've described an incredible odyssey. So, because the question people want to know is, what is the attraction of Scientology for celebrities? Mm -hmm. and, and you've described this inclusive love bombing, the support system, this codependent relationship. Absolutely. And, and I, ha I, hadn't realized, I hadn't realized that existed there. Wow. And, and, and that's a question so many people have, and yet the way you describe it, what, what fascinates me is you begin Scientology auditing, you do, you're doing courses, right? Mm-hmm. And suddenly, suddenly, at some point, your emphasis shifts from your career as an artist to mm -hmm. becoming a Scientologist. Yes, exactly. And, and the reason this is important, we all watched Tom Cruise go from being the world's biggest movie star, absolutely the world's biggest movie star, mm -hmm. and then 2005, he goes and takes on Matt Lauer and Psychiatry. Mm -hmm. in this epic meltdown on the Matt, the Matt Lauer show, which I couldn't believe I stayed home that day to watch it. And then he does this, this other thing over uh, his ex-wife, Katie Holmes, on Oprah. Mm -hmm. I mean, knowing what you know of celebrity, what do you think was going on with Tom Cruise at that time? I think it, it is a really similar phenomenon to what Peter and I went through, because when you start dipping into this purpose that seems bigger than you, it, in other words, it's, it's a, you know, the whole religious freedom game, which of course was manufactured by Scientology, but when you start believing that um, you could stand for something that's larger than you are, you get swept up in purpose. And of course, what's really going on is, well, like, I'll, and I'll touch on this again, is that codependent relationship, and I'll explain that a little bit more. But the underlying um, phenomenon that's really going on is that Scientology is set up to impose its will upon you, the individual. And all of Hubbard's writings, all of his teachings, 
the inclusive uh, environment at Celebrity Center, which is actually, I called it inclusive, but it becomes a coercive environment because what's going on there is uh, as you learn Scientology and you learn all these different concepts that Hubbard is teaching you about, uh, for example, this is a dangerous environment and the only thing place that on earth where you can be safe is in Scientology. Uh, if you're an artist, you're subject to attacks. So the only way to handle that is with Scientology PTS as PTAC. Uh, in other words, every, every problem in life is pitted against a solution that Scientology offers. So what's going on is that's how that codependent relationship develops is because your old thinking is replaced with Scientology solutions. And what's going on is that Scientology is, its pose, is imposing its will on you, and you are not aware of the fact that your free will is being taken over. You know, Scientology's will is taking over your life. And the irony of all that is all this is happening while you're studying about religious freedom that Scientology offers, total spiritual freedom. So while you're studying about total spiritual freedom, you never think to ask the question of how you're actually giving up your spiritual freedom in the process of studying about it. And, you know, to me, that's, that's that, how that codependency develops. You know, you're, you're depending on Scientology for your solutions, and Scientology is depending on you to be so in love with Scientology hook, line, and sinker, sinker, that you will become a walking mouthpiece for it, that you will endorse it, you know, that you will help to, you know, bring your social capital uh, to the promotion of the Scientology brand as a religion. So all of that is what we got swept up in. Personally, I think this, a similar thing happened to Tom Cruise, uh, only with him there was the added complication that David Miscavige was is clearly obsessed with Tom Cruise as a Scientology trophy and latched onto him so that he would never lose the biggest trophy that Scientology ever had. Um, but by what I know, because after living with Ron Miscavige and knowing him very well and many late-night talks in the kitchen – with Ron Miscavige, it became very clear to me that his son, David, was living vicariously through Tom Cruise. Maybe the childhood or growing up that he never had, but whatever. But here he is, a Scientology leader, befriending the most famous actor on the planet, uh, who is now his trophy in Scientology. So we see David Miscavige living through Tom Cruise, and we see Tom Cruise taking on this role of this you know, insane megalomaniac who knows everything about psychiatry, which is why he was was able to flatten Matt Lauer like he tried to. So I think all of that, you know, it all ties in. It's the celebrity spirituality thing, and I and I describe that in a lot of detail in my book. In fact, I have a whole chapter on how celebrity spirituality develops in a person and how it really tries to overtake your own free will. Now, this is uh, intriguing to me. My, my, my friend, John Atac, the, the, the writer, researcher, historian, who, who was a Scientologist, uh, he's the author of Let's Sell These People a Piece of Blue Sky. That was the first book I read when I got out of Scientology, by the way. John Atac gave me so many answers. Uh, I, in fact, I credit him in my book numerous times for writing such an awesome book, A Piece of Blue Sky. Oh, he, he's, he is a he's walking incredible. encyclopedia. Yeah. He, al- he also wrote a very exquisite work called The Total Freedom Trap, Scientology, Dianetics, and L. Ron Hubbard. And what you were saying earlier, Scientology is designed where they're selling you freedom, yet it's becoming a trap. You're becoming, freedom becomes slavery. Mm-hmm. And, and the important thing is, even a, even a superb artist supremely gifted artist, actor, singer. No one is immune to something as highly engineered as Scientology when they recruit you, indoctrinate you. I was always astonished. They're almost telling you what they're doing. Like like, uh, L. Ron Hubbard designed a course called Upper Level Indoc, meaning Upper Level Indoctrination. 
Mm -hmm. And they tell you they're indoctrinating you. (laughs) And it's right, it's staring you in the face, but it doesn't occur to you, is upper level indoctrination a good thing to have? Because the, because one thing that goes on at Celebrity Center, one, there's a lot of organizations or churches in the Scientology hierarchy, right? Mm-hmm. There's lower level churches, but it's an honor to be a Celebrity Center public, to be a member of Celebrity Center. So there's already a natural elitism that, that appeals to an artist. Absolutely. That's part of the, you know, that intravenous drip that you're on from the moment you walk in the front door and you're now on the rosters of the course room. Off topic for a minute. Here in Los Angeles, one of the most humiliating things that can happen to a Scientologist, I think you'll agree, would be to be kicked out of Celebrity Center as a public and be sent down to pack base. <laughs> and, and how it has happened. Now, that's a loss of prestige, a loss of face. Isn't it that quite embarrassing? Oh, I would say it's the worst. I mean... You know, that reminds me of, um, maybe this is a good time to bring up that a story that relates to that. In the ni- early 1990s, it might have been 1990, 1991, um, Celebrity Center underwent huge renovation. And um, the church management poured millions of dollars into that building. Because right around that time, Tom Cruise um, had come into Scientology through Mimi Rogers and the Enhancement Center. And so, you know, the goal was to have him be active at the at the Celebrity Center. So they made it beautiful for him as an A-lister and all the people that they were hoping that he would recruit. Now, related to that is besides beautifying the building, we did projects there to beautify the staff. And um, David Miscavige personally got me to work on a uniform program for the Sea Org members to put them into these beautiful suits, and I, I designed the suit. I worked with Claudio Lugli, who was a fashion designer in Italy, a Scientologist, and Claudio Lugli and I did the Celebrity Center Uniform Project um, to make the staff look beautiful. But as part of that, there was another project that was run on a special mission where they went through and looked at all the staff at the Celebrity Center, and they handpicked certain people that did not physically match the standards or the like aesthetic appearance that they wanted for the CC staff. So to be blunt and uh, to be truthful about that, what that really meant was if they thought you were not attractive or too thin, too fat, not good looking enough, had some sort of physical impairment or whatever, uh, they traded CC staff with other staff uh, from the Los Angeles area and in some cases from other states and brought in all good-looking people. Uh, some of them were more highly trained as well, but the point was, you know, beautiful people for the beautiful building. Uh, and uh, that was one of the most humiliating things I've ever seen a Sea Org member ever having to go to. Can you imagine being one of those Sea Org members who was chosen to leave because you weren't good looking enough? Oh, it would be humiliating. And and this speaks to the uh, vacuity, the, the, the soullessness. Scientology talks a lot about the Thetan, about how the Thetan incarnates through a series of bodies and lives. You know, we've been male, we've been female, et cetera, right? Mm-hmm. And yet, when push comes to shove, they want only the beautiful people. Mm-hmm. So if you're not quite good looking enough, you're out of here. If you're too old. And this is something I, I, I noticed, and I, and I want to share with new Scientology watchers. If you go into a major Scientology facility, like the Testing Center on Hollywood Boulevard, the L. Ron Hubbard Lifetime Museum, there are only very attractive young people as receptionists. So mm. the pra- the mm-hmm. practice spread from Celebrity Center, apparently, uh, because I remember uh, going into the L. Ron Hubbard Lifetime Museum, I think around 2004. I had a couple hours between calls, and I thought I would check out you know, the museum. And I remember the staff were all beautiful people, beautiful young people. Mm-hmm. And the impression it made on me being in sales 
I'm thinking they're doing this deliberately. And the fact that they did this they did this upgrade for Tom Cruise at the Celebrity Center, let's remodel the manor mm-hmm. and, br- and bring in beautiful staff, kick out the ones that don't quite cut it. Mm-hmm. David Miscavige does it again with the ideal orgs where Tom Cruise says that these orgs weren't, aren't good enough for my friends. Mm-hmm. So, so that's the genesis of that ideal org program. Absolutely right. It's It all pulls back to David Miscavige. Um, and Want, Wanting to make Tom Cruise happy. Wanting to make Tom Cruise his, you know, his iconic celebrity happy. Um, but it, it spreads across so many things. Um, I was the commanding officer at Celebrity Center up until about late 89. And I went up to the Imp base. And because I had been a fashion designer and an artist, um, you know, my skills were utilized for projects. And um, as a matter of fact, David Miscavige, the first project I ever had was the Celebrity Center uniform project with Claudia Lugli. After that, um, he basically sent me, I did projects uh, directly under him and um, Shelley Miscavige, who was the chairman of the board's assistant. And we, they would send me to places ar- around the Scientology world, you know, on several different continents. And the whole point was, was to go and make the Scientology staff look beautiful while the buildings were being renovated because I came to, to realize that David Miscavige cares more about the image of Scientology and the perception, public perception that Scientology is good because it is really good looking. Uh, he cares more about the image of Scientology than the people that dedicate their lives to it. And of course, I'm specifically talking about the Sea Org members who basically work like slaves and have no life. But he cares more about the image of Scientology than anything. And as a matter of fact, in my book, I uh, go through some rather painful paragraphs of uh, situations that I found myself in because I was sent around the world to do these different uniform projects. And uh, what I found, um, for example, when I went to um, uh, in the UK at St. Hill, the original Hubbard's original home in England, I was sent to the UK to totally overhaul the staff because that coming October was going to be the big IAS event. So this would have been 1993. And I was told before I went on the project that the UK staff, you know, that they were, he used some really bad words to describe them that I won't even uh, use here because I don't want to hurt people's feelings. Sure. It's just that Um, what he said about the staff, what they looked like, um, what they smelled like. And he, he wanted me to make them over and to do this uniform project. So I literally, you know, I did haircuts and makeovers with makeup and created this beautiful uniform program for them. And it's, it was as if the staff literally transformed just by being taken care of, just by somebody caring about them and see that was that was my issue i mean i loved to design the clothes but what i really loved was to take care of the staff and do you know after i did that saint hill project um david miscavige chairman of the board and mark yeager who was at the time the commanding officer of commodore's messenger org international they came to the uk to for the uh, ias event preps and they walked the whole State Hill base and they looked at the staff and they couldn't believe their eyes. What a, what a transformation it was. But for me, it was so heartbreaking to know that, you know, all it took was somebody to come in, care about them, have a little budget, give them some beautiful clothing, care about the staff, give them time to do proper grooming and really shine as individuals. And that's what, you know, that's what happened. That was the product that I got there. So after that, I was sent on projects around the world to do this in other bases. And I just want to bring up one more project like that uh, was when I was sent to AOSHEU, the Advanced Horgs St. Hill in Copenhagen. And before I was sent on that project, I was specifically told by David Miscavige and Mark Yeager 
that I had to handle the problem with the staff who stunk. And they literally talked about the stench of the staff there was so bad that they felt they were in glee, they were laughing over this, of sending me over there to have to handle this problem. And, you know, I thought, what's going on with this? So I went over there to do the project. But what I found is the staff that lived in the Nordland, the Sea Org members, the showers didn't work. There was no hot water. And after 16-hour work days, who's going to stand in line to take a shower in cold water in Copenhagen? And so you want to know why the staff stunk? Because they didn't have proper facilities. So why didn't management just take care of that? So it just took somebody to come in and care about them and to handle the problem. And then we did the clothing. And then it completely transformed the staff. So again, what I'm, the point of me telling you all these details is that what I learned about the leader of Scientology, chairman of the board, RTC, is that he cared more about the image of Scientology looking good than he cared about the people in it. Billy Crystal uh, does a uh, knockout Fernando Lamas imitation. You know, you did on Saturday Night Live. Mm-hmm. And Billy Crystal's quip was, it's better to look good than to feel good. <laughs> and and it's a, it's a funny quip, but in Scientology it happens to be true that the well-being of Sea Org and staff doesn't mean anything. They are coins in the language of Scientology. Absolutely. And Sea Org members are so depersonalized. Depersonalized, you know, Matt, dehumanized. You are so right. Oh, Matt Pesh told me a story. Uh, you know, he was a uh, trash sack down at Flag Land Base in, in Clearwater, Florida. And a problem down there in the heat is foot fungus. Mm-hmm. And... You know, you're working 18 hours a day. You don't get to take your shoes off. Right. And you develop you develop foot fungus. And Flag Land Base's answer to Sea Org members with that problem was to make it go right, <laughs> which is, a, which is a, non, a non-answer. Scientology does not treat its staff members well. And it gets worse when you leave. One thing I wanted to ask you, Karen, now, when Ron Miscavige and his wife, Becky, dear friends of mine, left the church, and Ron wrote his book, the church immediately puts a hate site up Right, on right. And your ex, Peter Schles, attacks Ron Miscavige as a crappy, lousy musician. Yeah, I was, you know, when I saw that video, I was flabbergasted. Um, I mean, let me backtrack just a little bit to explain why I would say that. Please. Uh, yeah, um, first of all... I'll talk about Peter and Ron, and as well as Peter, and then the four of us. Um, Ron recruited Peter up to gold, and at one point, Peter and I and Ron and Becky Miscavige shared an apartment. That's how married couples live at the Int Base. You're in a two-bedroom apartment that you share. And we got to be absolutely close, dear apartment mates and would talk, you know, to all hours of the night about things. Not to mention that Ron uh, recruited Peter into gold and Ron was the music director for a while. And Ron covered Peter's ass so many times when Peter's submissions were not getting approved. He would cover for Peter. He would back Peter up. He would help. And, uh, you know, he went all out. They went all out for each other, actually, back and forth at times. So when I saw this video, I thought, what in the world would drive Peter Schles to manufacture lies about Ron Miscavige, much less throw him under the bus with all the, um, you know, hurtful, uh, destructive things that he said about Ron. And all I could think about was Peter and I, we were, we were, we had a really deeply loving marriage before we joined the Sea Org. And so I knew him better than anybody. And at Gold, actually after I left, uh, Peter was thrown in what's called the hole. For anybody listening who doesn't know what that is, it's kind of like uh, uh, a detention center in a double-wide trailer where staff are treated like animals in inhumane conditions and punished. And and kept locked in 
uh, and not allowed to leave, they ate leftover food and were, you know, took showers in the garage once in a while. And meanwhile, they dehumanized each other by just outrageous behavior. Why am I bringing this up? Well, because Peter had been in the hole and he had been in and out of the hole. So however long he spent in there, I'm not exactly sure, but I know he was in there between 2004 and 2007, I believe. So by the time, and I don't know if he had been put back in there, by the time I saw this video, because Ron Miscavige left in 2012, and I believe the book came out, am I right, Jeff, around 2016, yeah. Um, yeah. Peter would have never read Ron Miscavige's book. A Sea Org member would never be allowed to read a book by a person like Ron, who at that point was a declared SP. So Peter must have been told that Ron was writing a book without knowing anything that he said in it. So why would Peter manufacture lies about Ron, and why would he say those things? I can only imagine that because Peter had been in and out of the hole, who knows if he had ever uh, gotten back into good standing with David Miscavige. So the first motivation would be uh, to throw Ron under the bus and try to destroy him as a means of gaining approval or gaining some kind of graces from David Miscavige or possibly even, you know, making amends for some lower condition. Um, but even beyond that, because I believe that would be no, the number one motivator, if he didn't throw Ron under the bus and support David Miscavige's attack on his own father, then Peter himself would have gone under attack as if he would have been a Ron Miscavige sympathizer. So there was no choice there. You know, that was a, a, a position of being put in a place where you say this or you're going to be in trouble. Yeah, you have no choice. And, and that was, you know, I went through the whole, the, the website to watch it and look at the people and analyze details. Mm -hmm. And, and my, my opinion is they really had no choice in the matter. You see, uh, yeah. Jenny they had Alpers, no yeah. you know, uh, Jenny Alpers was one time an executive who'd been busted down to the kitchen at the base. Mm hmm. What you're saying is exactly my point as well, where I was going with it, because, you know, he believes that he has no choice but to support Miscavige, because at that point, what that's showing you, that is a perfect example of seeing how a Scientologist completely loses themselves. They no longer have their own moral compass. They no longer have their own free will. Scientology's will and David Miscavige's will is totally has totally taken them over. So to that extent, they believe they have no choice, and now, you know, now, support it, it is their choice. Now, Karen, does this hold true to a lesser extent for celebrities who belong to Scientology? Oh, I absolutely believe so because that ties back to the what I was talking about regarding celebrity spirituality. It's a uh, you know when you when you become you know, when you move beyond the basic services, like, you know, when you, a celebrity, when they first get into Scientology, they're just sort of, you know, dipping into the Scientology appetizers, you know, the basic courses and the intro auditing and things like that. And by the time you, you know, you're kind of, yeah, I like this. This is, you know, really helping me. Like, you know, when Peter and I got into Scientology, we, we got in, we weren't looking for religion. We were looking for, um, like uh, ways to improve ourselves as artists and we took a communication course and believed that it helped us so the point being when you get a little bit of help on some of these intro services you then take the leap from you know the intro level services to the main Scientology services you know by the time you're doing that by the time you've taken that leap and you've made the decision you know I'm gonna go clear or I'm gonna get trained fully trained as an auditor by the time you make that decision you have become a stable Scientologist you have become somebody who is all about keeping Scientology working and so by the time you get that mindset you know you're already believing that clearing the planet is the most important thing there is to do and when once you believe that you start letting go of your career focus you know you're not as uh uh, well, at least we weren't, and I've seen it in so many celebrities. 
yes, they're still pursuing their career and they rely on Scientology for that help, but they believe that they can't do it without Scientology. And so now they've gotten themselves into this codependent relationship that it is almost impossible to get out of. I mean, yes, and I'm, I'm, and I'm glad you mentioned that because codependency answers the question I've had. Will John Travolta ever leave the church? John and Kelly? Will Tom Cruise? Well, not if it's codependent. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you some questions uh, about uh, celebrities in the Celebrity Center. Okay. First of all, the Celebrity Center is a beautiful building. It was originally a luxury hotel mm -hmm. here in Hollywood, and the church purchased it and renovated it. Okay, so that's the layout. You can Google Scientology Celebrity Center and see the pictures of it. It's gorgeous. Now, I, r I write about that in the book, too. I talk about what it was like in the heyday of the 1930s and the celebrities that were living there in there as a hotel, which, of course, have nothing to do with Celebrity Center of today. But the reason they tie that in all the time when they give tours is to just do the name dropping like, Years ago, this place was filled with American idols, and that's how it's going to become again, sort of a thing. Oh, I see. Yeah, that, that, I, I could see that they would, they would name drop like that, because mm -hmm. you had people like Charlie Chaplin stay there. I mean, uh, Greta Garbo, you yeah, know. Um, you can go down the list of yeah. American icons who stay there in the acting community. But now, let's say that I'm um, – I, I have two questions I, I've been really wanting to ask you. First of all, there's the talk that there's a secret entrance for celebrities into the Celebrity Center. How does that work? <sighs> That's been a, a well-kept secret. <laughs> they never like to talk about it because they didn't want non-celebrity people to know. Because they, you know, they, they create such this exclusive environment and there's a whole strategy for that. And the strategy is, let's say that Tom Cruise wants to bring in Will Smith, for example. Um, is he going to bring him in through the main parking lot where all the regular people are parking their cars? And are they going to walk through the garden cafe where everybody can gawk at this A-list celebrity? Of course not. Because that could, that could be a factor that would deter, deter a celebrity from even stepping foot on the property, they don't want to be seen yet there. They don't want to be identified yet as a, as a Scientologist. So that's part of the recruitment process is providing secret passages, secret spaces, uh, exclusive passages and spaces. So, you know, in my day, we uh, set up a private entrance um, that came into the building by the president's office and the president's office was a two-story room that had a spiral staircase from one level to the next so you come in through the lounge and you go up the spiral staircase into the president's office where you would have these you know private meetings and because you've come in this private entrance no one else on the celebrity uh, celebrity center property knows that that this person is there how do they get in? Well, they, they could have been dropped off by a chauffeur or uh, later they made accommodations for pri a private parking entrance so that certain people were privy to coming into this entrance by a prearrangement so that they could get into the parking area, pull in and come up that private entrance that led to a passageway that led to the president's quarters. And all of that was changed during the renovation. You know, it started out with the one I told you in the beginning, and then during the renovations, it was developed um, so that there were more more spaces and more spaces for specific people, like specific level of celebrity. For example, celebrities, you know, well-known television personalities like, or um, you know, like Leah Remini. Elizabeth Moss, um, Giovanni Ribisi, they, you know, they, they were the celebrities in that particular course room, but there were specific private auditing spaces for people on the level of Tom Cruise, John Travolta, um, and they had their own auditing rooms, they had their own course rooms. They had, for example, president's assistants that would do things like dress the room with fresh flowers. Uh, and have snacks or tea service 
and things like this. In other words, they were treated uh, with special care that was only available to depending on the level of celebrity that you were. Mm. So it's like even within Celebrity Center, there were quote-unquote levels of celebrities. And the whole reason that was set up is so that people like Tom Cruise and John Travolta, who were privileged to that special treatment, that they could bring in their guests of that level. Oh, um, I see. Mm-hmm. And so, so they could guarantee total confidentiality and total privacy so that they wouldn't even be seen or gawked at. And then you had the level of, you know, what we would consider major celebrities. I, I mentioned Leah Remini, Giovanna Vibrisi, Jenna Elfman, you know, Kirstie Alley, Ann Archer, many of the people that Scientology or that people connect with Scientology is the most recognizable celebs. They would be in the celebrity course room and have special auditors, um, special auditing spaces, things like that. But like I said, so there was like the A list and the B list, so to speak. And I hate using those terms because I think it's really um, demeaning uh, to try to categorize like level of success. But but it happens. I I, I take your point. Uh, okay, so let me let me give you a, a, a hypothetical. I'm a I'm an A list Hollywood celebrity. Now I want to experiment with Scientology, but I don't want anyone to know I'm going anywhere near Scientology. In fact, I'm even uncomfortable going to the Celebrity Center. What can you do for me if I'm interested in getting a few sessions or some courses, but I don't want to even go anywhere near the place? Well, the President's office is staffed with assistants and special auditors, and it was not uncommon uh, for the President or her representative to go to a celebrity's home, arrange an auditing session, an introductory session with a special celebrity auditor. That happened. That's, that had, you know, that was a special service that, so that uh, the president's office had to provide in order to make it comfortable for people who didn't want to come into the building and who didn't want to be identified as a Scientologist. So, they receive private service at home or a designated spot. At a time, we had a team of celebrity auditors. You know, I'm thinking about uh, Chris and Stephanie Silcock, who were designated specifically under the president to audit celebrities that we were trying to recover, such as John Travolta, who was sort of falling off the lines at that time. And we used to fly Chris or Stephanie Silcock out to his set to take him into session. Really? Yes. So it's a no expense spared when you were trying to recover John Travolta. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember having a conversation with Chris Silcock who talked about uh, being flown out to wherever John Travolta was filming and showing up, you know, and, and telling John, you know, hey... You know, I thought, you know, we'd take some time. I'll take you into session. This is going to help you feel a lot better. And Chris telling me stories of what it was like to just show up and sort of ambush JT and say, we're going into (laughs) session today. Um, And by the way, Stephanie Silcock ended up on the RPF's RPF, and Chris did as well, but he routed out of the Sea Org, and at that time, Stephanie had decided to stay in. I don't know if she still is, but I know that Chris went back to South Africa. But he went. He left with really horrendous um, memories about things that he had to do just to cater to privileged, you know, celebrity individuals. Yes, and I could see that, that there would be some demands made. I, uh, Sumner Redstone he famously fired Tom Cruise from Paramount in 2005. Mm. 2006, maybe. Mm-hmm. He said, we, we, Viacom, don't care to have an individual on board who effectuates creative suicide. Mm. And so Sumner Redstone himself mm-hmm. called an involvement with Scientology where it was very demonstrative, career suicide. Mm-hmm. And after that, you know, there was talk that Will and Jada Pinkett Smith were crypto Scientologists. And they had opened a school and maybe they were dabbling in it. 
And there was talk that maybe Jim Carrey had been involved. And there, a lot of names went around the Internet. Mm-hmm. And, and so it was, it, there was a sense of people backing away. Now, Karen, how would David Miscavige feel about someone who was a dilettante? That is, a celebrity who wanted to get Scientology auditing and services, move up their bridge, but didn't want to be publicly identified. Was there a negotiation or... What happens at that case? Well, that that's actually been an ongoing problem, um, actually, for years. Um, I'll backtrack to the first time I remember us developing what was called a celebrity recovery project. And we set up this special office with designated um, celebrity auditors. And we were reaching out to people who had dabbled in Scientology, but were not moving forward. They were not moving up the bridge, and they were not they were not disseminating. And what I mean by that is they weren't telling the world about Scientology, about how it was helping their careers. And the people that were on that project included Edgar Winner, Isaac Hayes, John Travolta. Those are the three right off the top of my head. And quite a few more. I know that Edgar Winner and Monique Winner were on the project. Um, but those are some big people. Those are some big people. So really, you, when you bring someone like Edgar Winner or John Travolta, I mean, you, you bring that caliber of, of talent in to put some pressure on maybe lower-level people who aren't stepping up. That's inti- That's got to be intimidating to a celebrity to have Isaac Hayes show up at your house saying, hey, I'm here to help you get back on the bridge. <laughs> I mean, he, Isaac Hayes is the man. He did Hot Buttered Soul. How could you <laughs> tell me? How could how could you say no to him or John Travolta? You know that's been the the challenge uh, that Celebrity Center has faced all the time. Because track, fact of the matter is, uh, I'll bring up a personal story. Peter and I recruited Frank Stallone into Celebrity Center, Sylvester Stallone's brother, and uh, Peter had been working with Frank on Sylvester Stallone's movie Rambo: First Blood Part Two. And Peter and Frank wrote the theme song for, for Rambo, First Blood Part Two. And in doing so, we went into the recording studio for Frank to record the vocals to the song, Peace in Our Life. And Sylvester Stallone came into the studio while we were there. And Peter and I looked at Sylvester. And, you know, we immediately saw, hey, recruit, recruit, recruit. <laughs> you know, it's like, here's, here's some raw meat. And I'll bring that term up. We were always on the hunt for raw meat, and yeah. raw and, meat. And can, Karen, let me interject. Okay. For for new, we have a lot of new listeners. Yes, Scientology I'll define audience. that. What does raw meat mean in Scientology? Yeah, raw meat is a Hubbard. It's it's written in a policy and defined by Hubbard as someone who has never heard of or has never done any Scientology, like com- a completely new individual, and. So Scientology, we were always, as celebrity recruiters, we were always on the hunt for raw meat. And so when we saw Sylvester Stallone walk in, <laughs> what we saw was raw meat. <laughs> and, you know, he was flanked by three bodyguards, so we never had the opportunity to have a conversation, and we only discussed the song Peace in Our Life for the Rambo soundtrack. Karen, off on a tangent, you, yeah. you, have, you, must, you must indulge me in so, some of my tangents. That album that uh, that Frank Stallone appeared on, that Scientology album, Road to Freedom. Yeah, that was just was that an embarrassment to the church? <laughs> like pow, like like what is it? Uh, Power of Source, Road to Freedom. Oh, what did you think when you heard these LRH produced records? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, spit it out! Come on, I want to hear your I want to hear your crimes. I... What did you think? <laughs> I thought about the the music like I thought yeah. about the films that Scientology made. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> the films, I mean, when Peter and I were at the Celebrity Center, you know, back in the 80s, and we would watch these training films, we would look at each other and say, really? Are you kidding me? We're supposed to take this seriously. I mean, you know, the bad production, the bad acting, the, you know, the middle school props, the whole nine yards, and... The Road to Freedom album actually was something that a lot of people at Gold, Golden Air Productions who produced it, they were very proud of it because it was the first uh, recording of its kind that um, were 
basically L. Ron Hubbard music or lyrics, one or the other, uh, that were produced by the Golden Era musicians. And Peter Schles was involved, Frank Stallone, I remember Leif Garrett, David Pomerantz, uh, Raven Kane. I think David Campbell was on it. There were so many people on this. Um, they were just so proud that they got all these celebrities to participate in, in recording this. So from that perspective, they were proud. They were proud of it. From an audiophile listener, not so much. <laughs> Karen, were you there at the Universal Amphitheater when the big world of view of L. Ron Harvard's Power Source album was introduced? I was. I was. I mean, it was a packed house, too. Well, what was your impression when you started hearing the music? I mean, you're, you know music. You, I mean, you know, you know world-class music from Peter Schles. <laughs> um, God, I had so many mixed feelings about it. I mean, you know, I thought that some of the music was so, um, wow, how do I put this, amateurish? Well, that would be fair. I mean, I, I thought it was cringeworthy, especially when... L. Ron Hubbard sings, thank you for listening. Oh, my gosh, yeah. yeah. But you know what? Um, the Sea Org members and the Golden Air musicians and even the celebrities, they, were, they seemed to be so proud of it because it was the first of its kind. And this is an interesting point you're bringing up because this phenomenon that happens of like, for example, an L. Ron Hubbard film or these L. Ron Hubbard songs, or, or like the Ron Max, these things would come out, and everybody would say, isn't this awesome? And, but you would be believing the opposite. You know, you would be thinking like, oh my God, I wouldn't be caught dead doing this. And, but yes, you say, oh yeah, it's awesome. And it, there was like this double, this double think, you know, where you were, Believing one thing, but saying another, and it was all about, it's like false PR, you know? Well, no, that, I'm, I'm glad you said that, because when I hear those two, those two music albums, and, and there, you can go on YouTube, Power Source, uh, on, Get on the Road to Freedom, people can listen to them and decide for themselves, but when L. Ron Harvard wrote about art, he considered himself an artist, I... You know, he could write, obviously, but he was he didn't know much about music. And when you had world-class talent, they were almost like playing mm-hmm. down mm-hmm. to an amateur. Mm-hmm. Because the, the skill level, uh, the talent level that Scientology had at that time was enormous. Yes, it was. And yeah. yet when you have to play down to cater to L. Ron Hubbard's amateurish skills... Mm-hmm. And look, as a photographer, he's a lousy photographer. <laughs> you, you, if you get the book, What is Scientology? He does this pose of these historical religious figures throughout history, and they're ascending upwards. And oh, my goodness. The Scientology minister is at top, you know, the pinnacle of 50,000 years of thinking men, it, right? It's such an embarrassment uh, well, professionally. It's, it's, you know what's funny is you have, in one of those, they made Mark Hadley, author of Blown for Good, one of my favorite books, uh, they put him, put a beard on him, dressed him up like Jesus. <laughs> and, and so I just wanted to add that part in that, that L. Ron Hubbard professed to know everything about art mm-hmm. and what a rock song is. He did an analysis of what a popular rock song would be. Yeah. And you read it, it's hysterically funny. Y- and yet, yeah. <laughs> so... So what's your opinion of L. Ron Hubbard as an artist? You know, you're bringing up a really interesting point because, you know, my husband, Peter Schles, was a really excellent musician, and he was an award-winning composer. So he goes up to Golden Air Productions, and he is made to study what LRH had to say about music and the arts. And all of a sudden, with all this L. Ron Hubbard stuff thrown into it, you know, I'm seeing this, what I consider to be a brilliant composer and a great musician, all of a sudden having trouble getting compositions approved because he's having to apply what Hubbard is saying to his music. And now this award-winning composer can't get a submission approved through David Miscavige, who, by the way, is not a musician, but yet he requires his approval on all the music that is coming out of the music department. 
So <laughs> between L. Ron Hubbard messing up the process of creating music and then David Miscavige trying to approve it when he's not even a musician created an absolute nightmare for Peter as an artist. So that's how I wanted to answer that question. Oh, that's a, I, I appreciate the answer because there would be cognitive dissonance. Peter has great natural talent and suddenly it's almost like if Peter's a Ferrari musically, right? Mm -hmm. And that's fair to say. It's almost like hooking an Airstream trailer to him. <laughs> exactly. They're, they're, they're two unlike things that will not work. More like a Winnebago. <laughs> Winnebago, okay. You know, it's like hooking two unlike things together. And we saw that with John Travolta's catastrophic movie, Battlefield Earth. Great example. He, he so badly wanted to make that to please the Commodore, mm -hmm. Mr. Hubbard. Mm -hmm. And yet the movie was such a barking dog. It was such and, a disaster. Oh, you know, uh, Mike Rinder talks about how David Miscavige was all over that movie. Mm -hmm. All over it, and they thought that this was going to really boom Scientology organizations. Was that the thinking inside the church? Absolutely. Gonna, Absolutely. That, okay, so, so you're at that time at Celebrity Center as the commanding officer? No, when, when that movie came out, oh, hold on, let's see. I think I was up at Gold at that point in the Cine Division. I mean, what was the hope and expectation? Well, the hope would be, of course, you know, to take Battlefield Earth and turn it into like this mega, you know, box, you know, blockbuster uh, for the sole purpose of, you know, obviously elevating L. Ron Hubbard's name as a writer, elevating Scientology as the center for the arts, <laughs> um, you know, making a great movie that would earn a lot of money. And uh, it was multi-purpose, you know. Lot. And it would, it would bring a lot of people into the church. And to bring a lot of people in. Oh, wow, if L. Ron Hubbard is this cool and, you know, this movie is so great, then what else is there about Scientology that would be great that I could find out about? I mean, that would be the obvious message. Of course, as you know from Mike Rinder, David Miscavige threw JT under the bus and blamed it all on him. Karen, I know that Sea Org members were given tickets and they had to see the movie several times to help up the attendance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I've talked to Sea Org members who just cringed. They went, oh my God, this is horrible. Yeah. There are still people inside Celebrity Center who are hoping to make it through Scientology. What is your message to them? You're talking about um, people who have stepped into Scientology believing that Scientology was going to help them with their careers? Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, that's an interesting question because if you look at it from the perspective of, you know, well, everyone has the right to, for their religious freedom. They can, they're free to believe what they want to believe, okay? You can grant that to people. But in the case of Scientologists who come in being promised that they were going to gain many abilities that were going to help their careers and uh, improve their success, I guess what I would say to them is, you know, it's really important to step out of that for a bit and really examine your choices and examine really how much has Scientology helped you? How much has your career advanced because of it? Um, how close are you to your family? Um, and to do the research on the outside to acquire other information so that you know what you're walking into as you move to the advanced levels. It's so important to not accept just your, you know, your field staff member's opinion or, or your registrar's opinion, but to get the research, get the facts from the outside so that you know what you're heading into. Because there are many people who have dedicated their lives to moving up the bridge all the way up through OT8 only to get to the end and say this is it are you kidding me and I've spent you know millions of dollars for this so I guess that's what I would advise I know there, the Church of Scientology goes to casting calls and they promise young people who come to Hollywood in hopes of an acting career that Scientology can help you with your acting career you can be like Tom Cruise mm -hmm. and so many of these people wound up being recruited into the Sea Org right at $50 a week or less and told that you really don't have any business acting, there's an urgency to save and clear the planet. 
which is more important in your career. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and you see careers go down in flames for that reason. Which is exactly what happened to Peter and Peter Schles and I. Yes, and I and I'm so glad you you wrote the book. We've been talking to Karen Schles Presley, author of Escaping Scientology: An Insider's True Story, My Journey with the Cult of Celebrity, Spirituality, Greed, and Power. Karen, it's been a privilege to have you on our show. Thank you so much, Jeff. You've been awesome to talk with. Thank you, and I look forward to part two. For Surviving Scientology Radio, this has been your host, Jeffrey Augustine, and as always, we'll be in very good touch.